Good morning. It is 1040 a.m. on Saturday, July 7th, 2018. I'm Christiana Ellis and I just got up. This is five more minutes. Slept in a little bit later even than usual on a Saturday because I was uh, I had to work late last night. Um, but uh, today is Saturday and that means that uh, I am continuing my summer project of rewatching the entire series run of The Venture Brothers in preparation for the new season starting in August. Uh, and so this week, I'm talking about season two. Uh, season two, I feel like, is where the show really sort of becomes itself, which I think is true of a lot of TV shows, for that matter. And because, you know, you always, the, they, you know, I, I, I say you always, like I'm part of the TV industry. But I, I imagine as showrunners, you know, there's always a concept when you start a season and you have pitch, pitches and ideas and, and plans. But it takes that first season to sort of figure out what works, what doesn't. And then when you start figuring out what works and what doesn't, uh, you grow from there. And so season two is where, uh, you know, we still have a few episodes that are more, uh, you know, like just kind of episodic, uh, where you just have some weird concept to them. But generally speaking, I think when they do that in this epi in this season, uh, the the episodes are very strong. But it's partly because that's not every episode, and you know, so to a large extent, what we're doing is we have episodic elements of a larger story that we're always driving everything forward. You know, so we start this season with uh, the monarch in prison, uh, the uh, doctor girlfriend now living with Phantom Limb, and the boys are dead, uh, blown up on their little hover bikes. Uh, and so we have an amazing sequence um, at the beginning of the first episode this season uh, set to, you know, this uh, trance mix dance uh techno album you know playing while uh we have uh you know everybody's sort of in their various states of melancholy and this idea that uh, uh you know dr venture is so distraught by the loss of his sons that he uh you know f you know travels the world and he's looking for himself and brock's trying to bring him back but he's just running away and it's eventually revealed that um it's not so much that he is sad because he's really not because as we learn that the boys <laughs> are clones have been cloned repeatedly because they die frequently <laughs> and all he's doing is running away because he just wants to enjoy the lack of responsibility for a while before they clone the, the kids again <laughs> So um, that's one of the things that this show does so well, I think, of framing something that where you have give characters a sympathetic um, emotion and then twist it, <laughs> turn a knife a little bit. Because that's that's one of the things in this show is that there's really not much in the way of characters that you could just say are unambiguously good people. I mean, you definitely have people whose hearts are in the right place. And then for that matter, um, it, aside from her being a supervillain, uh, Dr. Girlfriend's pretty, got a pretty good set of, of, you know, pretty good head on her shoulders, I guess is the phrase I was trying to get to there. Um, and, you know, ultimately she is like into costumed aggression um, but, uh, the, at the same time, she's, uh, off, often the, the one person in the show that displays real empathy. I don't know, actually, Dr. Orpheus is pretty good. He's kind of a goody two-shoes, really. I'm not sure he really has, like, he can be overprotective and perhaps obnoxious, but he, you know, he's not really selfish in the same way that a lot of the other characters. And I suppose, you know, like, the thing is, every character is just a little off, right? Because, you know, obviously, like, Hank and Dean are not bad kids. They're just messed up because their childhood is super weird. Likewise, you know, Brock is motivated by good things um, most of the time, but he definitely has 
substantial anger issues. And as we start to dig in in a little bit of this uh, season, uh, some trauma associated with past military experience and maybe current <laughs> current experience. So one of the things that I want to address briefly um, re-watching seasons one and two is that, you know, there's a handful of jokes that feel a little ooky. Um, uh, some of them related to suggestions that Dr. Girlfriend maybe is transgender, just, you know, um, and, uh, even though I, the show pretty much canonically establishes that she is not, she just has a deep voice, but, uh, you know, jokes where people like, oh, she's a little manly, I'm a little looking for scars, that sort of thing, um, that's a little, uh, and then, um, they all, the show also pretty uh, liberally uses uh, gay as a way of saying something's bad, uh, the word gay, and then um, also uh, the, you know, the, the R word uh, for someone who is developmentally disabled. Um, and, uh, you know, so those, those things, those parts of the show haven't aged well. Um, I know that what I what I can say what feels good in terms of recognizing that though is that the show improves in that regard. Um, it's also always not you know it's it's usually like I don't know I guess uh, you know Brock says it a few times. So I was going to say when it comes out of the mouth of Doctor Venture, I mean it's not exactly somewhat to be emulated, right? But uh, the show improves in that regard, but it's also important to put those things in the context of the larger facts about this show, which is that it has really pretty good uh, representation in terms of uh, lots of uh, queer characters um, that are awesome. Uh, and more and more so as the show develops. But like this season introduces the alchemist as part of Dr. Orpheus's Order of the Triad. Uh, introdu introduces Jefferson Twilight as, you know, al also in that. And, uh, you know, we get a lot more of uh, all sorts of different characters. But so everyone is kind of messed up in their own way. But the 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 show... It's a little bit like some of the characters. It's uh, often got its heart in the right place, but it's just a little bit off, a little bit messed up. And uh, I think it's interesting to look back to the earliest seasons of the show and recognize the places where it's like, okay, well, they're obviously, you know, comedy is subjective and obviously can very much be influenced by the time and place in which it's created. And, you know, the culture has moved past some of those things that are more offensive now. And it's nice to know that the show doesn't just dig in and continue to do that stuff as much as it, it, it continues to improve. And, you know, uh, there, there's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's better than average, ultimately, I would say, despite some um, unfortunate uses of various uh, words early on. Um, but there's some amazing episodes in this season. Um, for one, Escape to the House of Mummies Part 2 is kind of genius. Um, just in concept, the idea of taking um, a hypothetical three-parter, but then making an episode only of the middle chapter. So everything's crazy and we don't get to see any of the setup except for like this previously on. And there's some amazing stuff in there. Um, the, the episode of, uh, where we introduce Dr. Henry Killinger, uh, it's weird to have a villain based on a real guy, Dr. Henry Kissinger, cause it's definitely based on him, but that is, he, he's such a strange character to be super creepy and all that, but then ultimately has, uh, like imp basically gets the monarch and Dr. Girlfriend back together, which is, you know, like makes me love him just for that because I love the monarch and Dr. Girlfriend so much. I love that relationship. It's like my favorite thing about the show. Um, uh, but we also, you know, we get a lot more about uh, Molotov, uh, Molotov Cocktees. I always want to hesitate on that. Uh, I, I think there's probably, there's a good reason why the, uh, the show, like I was talking about with As Language Evolves, uh, the show moves away from her last name, um, 
I mean, on the one hand, <laughs> like she's kind of a ridiculous character already, and it's it's her name is a play on on a concept, right? But uh, you know, it's, you, it's uh, there's there's stuff that's l more funny and less funny about that character, and they they continue to work on the parts that are more funny. Um, but like some of the stuff with um, like Hunter Gathers is also an amazing character. Um, I hesitate to mention so much about Hunter Gathers being an amazing character in this season because we're only introduced to the character in this season, and uh, it it's a little hard to talk about that character in the way that um, Hunter develops. Uh, over the various seasons, we'll call her she for now because as we meet her in this episode, you know, the flashback, we might say he, now uh, she has transitioned. And it's interesting, again, it's like even though there's some jokes uh, uh, about the, the transgender element that are mm, edgy, um, nonetheless, the whole bit leading up to that in uh, um, in, in that episode is this idea of the code of no, you don't kill women, you don't kill children. And so for Brock, who has been sent there to kill Hunter and plans to do it, to not do it for that reason, in a messed up kind of way is him acknowledging Hunter's uh, womanhood. So it's a just, this is a weird show. <laughs> uh, but I will say that Hunter, if you have not watched the rest of the series yet, um, continues to develop. We get lots of... <laughs> I'm just looking forward to more stuff. But like, so this season also just expands everything. We get a lot more stuff about the Guild of Calamitous Intent and all of this stuff about how, like, the the bureaucracy and rules about how it works to get an arch villain, and this idea that, like, the the episode where we have um, Doctor Orpheus and uh, you know basically having supervillain tryouts, and the idea of uh, you know all of this uh, this bureaucracy of <laughs> supervillainy. Is just amazing stuff. It is so interesting to think about and silly, and yet it just it it works and it's great. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that I want to really call out. Um, I think that it's uh, yeah. I mean, you know, without just getting into an episode by episode, um you know, uh, walk through, uh, cause I've already talked a fair amount about it. Um, I'll maybe just, uh, you know, finish us up here, you know, where we, you know, where we end things at the, in the finale of this season. Um, but like I was saying at the beginning, I think this season is really kind of where the show becomes itself. Um, full, it becomes fully realized as what this show is. And it continues to evolve a little bit as we go. Um, but, uh, it's also, you know, just a recognition of these, you know, when we talk about the show evolves, it's more, it's responsive to society and kind of more than most shows would be because the seasons are so spread so far apart. Season one was done, aired in 2003 and 2004. Season two is 2006. And then season three doesn't air until 2008. And, uh. You know, so we've, uh, you know, it's spread out. Uh, but so we finish things with, first of all, confirming that David Bowie, who is a shape changer, is also the sovereign and leader of the Guild of Calamitous Intent, apparently. Um, which, again, is kind of like just an amazing choice. Um, what we finish is the marriage of the monarch and Dr. Girlfriend. So she is now Dr. Mrs. The Monarch. Uh, briefly, Dr. Fiance. Um, that's a f one of my favorite running gags, too, of just her name being Dr. Blank with <laughs> defining her relationship with the monarch uh, as uh, in, in her name, which is just a fun gag. Um, but we have both of the boys kind of 
in their own ways starting to do some stuff. We have them learn about the clone army. Um, we have, uh, you know, Brock starting to get to a point of maybe thinking a little bit more about all his violence and being a little bit more thoughtful about it. We get more stuff of uh, Venture and his brother and that developing relationship, you know, Jonas Jr. And, uh, and the, you know, phantom limb out of the picture, at least for now, possibly dead, maybe. Uh, but uh, it's, it's also kind of funny, the idea that his character having invisible limbs could lose the limb. <laughs> so it's kind of like you still can't see anything, but now it's actually not there. I think I'll leave it there for season two, but uh, I love the show and I'm more excited than ever to continue rewatching it. And so I will be back tomorrow for my rewatch of The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya to talk about Remote Island Syndrome Part 2. And in the meantime, talk to you tomorrow for five more minutes.